Welcome to the How Could You Podcast. I'm Lauren Tossi. And I'm Ryan Tossi. This is the show that makes you want to rip off your shirt and show grief your fucking tits and say, let's go. <laughs> of Happy all- New Year. <laughs> I just want to say, one, you always like chastise me for my foul language in the episode and be like, family friendly podcast, Lauren. And we're just Jamie Lee Curtis. Halloween ends right out the gate. <laughs> I I had to drop that quote in here. <laughs> the most maligned quote of the year. You know, and honestly, in a movie that is much maligned, to say that there's one line in particular, <laughs> not nah, let's burn it all down. I can't wait to talk about that movie at some point during this episode. I, I believe it will come up. I'm curious to see where it will. Welcome, everyone. If you have never joined us before, uh, thank you so much for checking out our podcast. We are two people who fell in love in a movie theater and never quite left. We started this uh, podcast in large part to fill gaps in our film knowledge as two movie-obsessed people that found that there were just certain movies we should have seen by now. Um, But we've continued it on, and it's evolved to be just kind of a fun conversation about film, sometimes things that are throwbacks, and sometimes a very contemporary conversation, like the one we're going to have today with our 2022 year in review coming to you in 2023. <laughs> you know, our, our listeners, I feel they know us at this point. They don't want anything promptly <laughs> from us. I it have, wouldn't be us. Honestly, I really, I think there's a, a, a really uh, lucrative betting pool to be run by how many times we say this is the schedule and then that's yeah. like not the schedule we go with. <laughs> We're on Tossy time. <laughs> yeah. Which, if you know us well, yeah. you know it's not coming when you expect it to be there. So no Tossy stakes today because... Pretty much the episode, right? Is a year of Tossie's takes. I like it. Um, you know, and I think you're, hopefully, I think some of the movies that that I've, I think we've compiled in our lists um, and how we're going to do this, I don't know that are things we've actually really gotten a chance to talk about. I think some of these will definitely be things we talk about in the upcoming Oscar season, but I'm excited to do this. But we thought that the, instead of each providing a top five or a top ten, that we'd have a little fun with us and that we would draft for our top fives. Now, the problem with this immediately is that there's a little bit of a hive mind about how we feel about film. So I think this is going to get vicious. I do. I think, you know, it could be one of our more contentious. This this could have a uh, dazed and confused versus uh, fast times type vibe of the evening. Only but. a more awkward argument because like, no, but we're both on the same <laughs> side. So we thought the only fair way to handle this would be um, if you've ever played the board game Blockbuster, there is an element of it. Um, so this is it's a movie trivia game or movie charades game, I guess would be the best way to describe it. Um, there's an element called head to head. Um, in the head to head round, you are given a category. You hit the button first. If you have a movie that fits that category and then your opponent needs to answer with another movie and it goes back and forth and back and forth until your IMDB of a mind has run dry and then the victor of this will get to have first pick in the overall draft. This is going to be riveting radio for our listeners. <laughs> so it, the best is I actually have had an imagining of this where it's so embarrassingly bad that we're done in 10 seconds, which I actually would be really merciful for the audience. But then I've also had this version of it of like, what if it's a category we know really well? And this is just you and I naming movies back and forth. It could be. Yeah. So we're, we're throwing out like uh, sequels and yeah. things like that. Right. There are some ground rules to this. Oh, yeah, did we take sequels off the table in the house rules yeah, for this? Yeah, I believe so. It might actually be in the rules. I, I feel like I'm going to be out quickly, though, because I'm pretty much, you know, I think I've talked about it on this before, but I'm pretty much Ralphie, you know, talking to Santa. Like, what's a football? <laughs> Ab- absolute lies. When it comes to gaming, you're highly competitive. Okay, so what you are going to hear is I'm going to turn over the card. I'm going to say the category. I'm going to hit the buzzer, and or I'm going to not hit the buzzer. First person to buzz in, they're going to hit the buzzer. This is going so well This is great. I love this. Okay. Are you ready? I guess so. Okay. Are you already cheating? I'm literally not even looking looking at at the the card. card. I'm literally not even. My thumb is over the writing. Here we go. Movies with a dragon. (laughs) Dragon heart. Reign of fire. Um... Uh, Peach Dragon. <laughs> How to Train Your Dragon. Oh, God. <laughs> I can't get Dragon Heart out of my head. <laughs> um. Oh, um. 
The Hobbit. Yeah, there is. One uh, of them. <laughs> the night before. <laughs> the night before. Oh She's my a God. dragon <laughs> in the air. Oh gosh. Um, somebody's just screaming. Um, oh, uh, Sleeping Beauty. Oh, nice. Um, Ready Player One. Oh gosh. Um, I think about one of the Transformers movies. <laughs> <laughs> that does not count. <laughs> I think that means I, I am victorious. I think you got. I, am I, victorious. Right. I have the number one draft pick. <laughs> you got the number one draft pick. You are the Chicago Bears <laughs> of the How Could You podcast. Also, I know someone's listening. They're like, "There's not a dragon ready player one." <laughs> I'm like, pretty sure there is though. I'm like almost positive in the one scene there is a dragon in the. I feel very confident about this. Actually, I've thrown a lot. <laughs> I do, and I also <laughs> smell like beef and cheese. Um, okay, so that is head to head. Um, mm, beef and cheese. If you've ever, <laughs> if you're listening and you've ever played movie trivia with us, you know we take that freakishly seriously, which I don't think should shock anyone who's I gotta ever. Gotta be honest this. though, like I'm. <laughs> <laughs> got a little nervous thinking about like a hundred people are so listening. Oh, I know. And they're like, God, guys, there's like so many very obvious picks for this. I know we probably missed some. Um, like, well, oh, um, oh, Shrek 2 would have been one of them, right? Is that when the yeah, dragon pops yep, up? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's that, get off this conversation. I feel like our dragon lore is like way lacking. And let's get into I really into hope this. there's a dragon movie from 2022 we both forgot about. Um, okay, so I get to pick first, which is very exciting. Um, Rain of Fire was the best one, though, just for the record. I was actually, I thought that's where you were going to start, and I had another movie loaded, and that's why Rain of Fire came out of my mouth so quickly. I just, there, there's one listener that's just oh, yeah. laughing hysterically right now. Oh, I'd say for, two for, listeners yes. that are laughing hysterically. Um, okay, so I have first pick, which is really challenging, because I think I'm trying to decide if I want to be kind or not. This is cutthroat like I, I feel like we're, these are like your number one draft picks so like yeah we're gonna be doing this a little differently right you're picking your top movie okay. i would think i mean unless you're trying to steal from me but well i was wondering because i know what your top movie is and i know what your number one pick is and oh. i kind of want to take it just to be spicy but i don't think i have it in me <laughs> um so my selection uh my my for my number one Lauren selection. Lauren is on the clock. <laughs> For the record, this is the second time we've done a draft-type episode. Wait, we, have we, we did it for a one? Super Bowl episode. Oh, my gosh, yeah. we did. Wow, we you're, just like, you're like a stealing much... from the ringer all around over here. <laughs> yeah, and I'm bringing Chris Ryan, K, like, agent of chaos energy to this, this podcast. <laughs> um, okay, so I am at my number one pick. It should not be much of a surprise if you know anything about the films that I enjoy the most. My number one pick is Damien Chazelle's uh, Babylon, which is the last movie I saw of 2022, um, which as soon as I... There was... We're going to talk about this movie undoubtedly during the Oscars podcast episode. There's like no way that this doesn't get uh, nominated. I don't know that it'll clinch um, because Hollywood as of late seems to be beleaguered by movies about Hollywood, which I think is kind of ridiculous. Um, but, um, you know, this is totally my style of film. This is I love La La Land. I, I love pretty much everything Damien Chazelle has done pretty fervently. Um I walked out of the movie and I grabbed you by the chest, like by the shirt. And I went, <laughs> this is how it's supposed to feel. And I felt so passionately that like, this is, this is what I want out of every movie. I think I wait all year for a movie that can do that. And the fact that one did that on New Year's Eve, there was no way I wasn't picking it. But I was also felt like this might be unkind because I could see you having wanted to pick it as well. Um, but yeah, my number one pick is Babylon with a bullet, and I and I feel very strongly about it. What are the rules to this? Am I allowed to say whether it would have been on my list? Yeah, is that is that yeah. fair? Yeah, okay, I so fair. I can tell you I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I was between, legitimately. No, I, was like, I wonder who you were between. Oh, okay. You're going to probably, one of us will probably pick it later. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> no, 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 no. What I thought your number one pick was going to oh, be. And okay. I was like, it's either going to be Babylon or something else, and I have yes. a feeling you're going to pick the something else right now. Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> probably. I'm so sorry. But I do want to say, uh, no, oh my gosh. No, that's the fun of this. And, and, and yeah, we knew, that's why we're doing it a draft way, because we realized if we did two top fives, we were going to have a bunch that overlap, so this way we get to talk about more. And I'm really glad you picked it and 
Um, it, it is. It's just a amazing, amazing film. Um, I, I've never been on cocaine. Um, <laughs> just letting everybody know. Uh, however, I, free body. If I, I would, I kind of wish that I was watching that movie because I think it only would enhance it in the best ways possible. Um, that movie was amazing and wacky and crazy, but also still had like real story and heart to it. Just, yeah, just a great piece of film work. I don't think, you know, I know you said we'll probably talk about it come Oscar time, and I think we will because of you and me. I don't know if it's going to get the love it probably deserves, but um, just a phenomenal film, and I'm glad you picked it and it's your number one because you're, you're, everything you said was completely spot on yeah. about it. There's Listen, it's a movie that rewards you for being a film nerd your whole life. Um, because there's so many illusions, uh, both things that are pretty mainstream Hollywood culture and things that you would like have to like, you know, know your history in a fun way, not in a pretentious way. I think in like a really fun and accessible way, it has one of the most bat crap crazy like scenes in turn. No, I'm just saying bat shit crazy because you're talking about cocaine. <laughs> like bat shit, <laughs> <laughs> like bat shit crazy like party sequences and and there's a scene like later in the film that I'm still trying to uh, process emotionally and physically. <laughs> um, but there's I don't know. It's just so great and it's like hard. I think as someone who loves film as much as we do and like loves like cinematic history, like it's like really hard not to like be totally engaged by it. And I don't think it's a thing that's like precious about Hollywood either. I think it shows it warts and all, and I think it allows itself to be both, like, celebratory and nostalgic and also, like, remorseful and cautionary. It's balancing a lot, and I think what Damien Chazelle can do with the pacing of a very frenetic scene is so masterful because it never feels sloppy. Every part of it feels so, like, eloquently chosen, and I think that's why... I can walk out of a film like that where you're talking about like, <laughs> like liking it to like being on cocaine and go, yeah, that is how it feels, but not in a way that feels like overwrought or like we're just being crazy to be crazy. But like, no, there's like a purpose of why it has to feel like this. It's amazing. I just still imagine somebody going up to Jamie and Chazelle and saying, like, what are your influences for this film? And him just being like, all of them. <laughs> yes, what directors yeah. have influenced you? All of them, oh, that, yes, <laughs> including myself. Like, he just, yeah, he just that's threw. actually very. Um, I take a lot of inspiration from me. Yeah. Although we keep making the joke about the cocaine aspect, and I just keep thinking about the office when when Ryan Howard's like, people will always sit, compare taking what stuff would be like taking cocaine who have never done cocaine. Yeah, but he's like totally being even pretentious when he says <laughs> yeah. that. Oh, but fantastic reference. But, yes. All right. um, Okay, fantastic number one. So what is your number one? I, I was going back and forth on whether I wanted to try to take a steal from you Ooh, or okay. if I wanted to just go straight up my number one. And I will go straight up my number one because I don't think <laughs> you're pointing at the poster on the wall and you are co completely correct. I do not think it's going to be any, um, you know, people have heard me talk about it on this. Uh, it's X. Ty yeah. West's yeah. X. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> Just, I just think it's a really great piece of film work. I, we have a year of maybe quite arguably one of the best years of horror of all time. Um, oh, I think that book's going to get written yeah. one day. Yeah. And this to me is at top of the list. Um, it is not going to be for everyone just because it's horror and there are a lot of aspects to it that are just not going to, you know, not be everybody's cup of tea. But if... If you can get past all of that, there is there's a lot of deep story going on there, deep meaning that Ty West is able to put in there and a lot of stuff that you just have a lot of introspective thinking to it. And it can kind of really mess with you on one end, but at the same token, really make you think in a good way, but also it gives you your frights. It gives you kind of every sense that you want with it. And just a really cool cast. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, Brittany Stowe at the top of her game. Kid Cuddy's awesome in it. Um, obviously, Mia Goth, I could sit here and talk all day about. Um, I have a feeling she might come up again today. Um, just, just a really great. Ty West is one of the best directors we have out there right now. And just keep, I will, again, keep going to all of this stuff. No, and I, and I, so I was pretty sure you were going to either pick Babylon or X, and I had even in my mind thought it would be pretty deliciously evil to take X from you. 
mainly because you're sitting at an vantage point where you can look at the poster from X. <laughs> so I was like, but no, I couldn't do it to you because you came out of that just like transfixed. And I think in a really incredible way, I feel like we'll do probably an episode on this at some point or the maxi universe, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I think that could definitely be down the line. It is when you say like, it's not for everyone. I think the thing is, is that there's a lot being done here with like, violence and like sexuality. I mean, at the heart of the story, there's a nudie film being made yep. and like, and I think that stuff you go, <clears throat> you know, Oh, you can't go into a prudish. You, you're going to maybe feel uncomfortable. However, it's actually other stuff that makes you even more uncomfortable because there's like a conversation that Ty West is having in this film about aging and beauty and star quality. That's like really refined. And I think is something that's and and also like you know what like are the the limitations of body or the expression of body and what does that have to mean in terms of like your relationality with the people outside of the film industry i don't know there's like really cool stuff that he's doing with us so yeah i'm glad you picked x rules uh, definitely, I think it's going to get interesting now because I kind of had an idea where. <laughs> so, oh, you're going to pick my. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, I actually don't think you know what I'm picking. Oh, next. okay. Yeah. Um, I went. So my number two, I went. I went back and forth. Um, and, I, and I'm going to uh, full disclosure. I know we don't like to put a timestamp on this, but it feels like pretty appropriate to get to pick this movie tonight. Um, I am picking, of course, the absolutely brilliant, the masterful, the mind bending, the totally creative and innovative um, everything everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still hate you. <laughs> <laughs> all, having, all in the best ways. Yeah. Yay, rain of fire. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is if you're watching the Golden Globes tonight and you weren't crying. um <laughs> <laughs> during the best supporting actor speech, check your soul. Um, I, I just, I remember walking out of this. So this is a movie that came out, what was that, in March, I think. Mm -hmm. And it, it's sometimes, I think, hard. The film has, like, a buildup. And I think, like, there's something we expect from, like, our summer films. And there's something we expect from the things that are coming out, like, pretty much from, like, at least in, in you know, American cinemas from, like, Thanksgiving through the new year. And I think that buildup is something that we don't often expect things to really take us in the first quarter. I've been sitting with this movie ever since. It's, like, beautiful and incredible. And, again, like, it's – it. Michelle Yao is, like, such an incredible, like, insanely beautiful talent. Like, there's not enough words to say to describe, like – what she is able to do in this film and also like the scope of her career um, and, and the influence that she's had. And I think like, you know, how it feels to watch her in this part. Um, it's just so it's so fantastic. And it's not it's like a movie that's like really hard to explain. I think the title explains it all, um, but it's incredible. And I hope I really desperately hope that we will be having longer conversations about this film come Oscars time um, because it deserves like everything because it's everywhere all at once. It deserves all the things. It's just, it's so beautiful. You, you asked me the other night about what was, what am I hoping wins the Oscar? And, and my answer can change this year a few times. Um, but this was definitely on top of that list. And I think back to when we saw it and I think we came out of it and said, you know, something along the lines of, you know, just give it all the Oscars now. Yeah, and yeah. I like exactly what you're saying. We're sitting in here in January and we just had the Golden Globes and, you know, it had its its representation there. And, you know, I think Oscar time, it still has a really good chance. And I and I like that. I like that it's still in the conversation. That's the 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 best part about it, because it's this quirky film that doesn't feel like it should be, but it really is. And it's all about family and love. And, and it's just told in this wild, great way. And yeah, the, um, the, the Daniels, um, I believe is how they, they get referred yeah, that's to, how they refer to yeah. um, are just, again, another innovative, you know, couple of directors that are just really yeah. putting out some really great work. And the cast is just phenomenal. So it's, it's just, it is, it's incredible. And like everything you're saying, like it is so much like a story about family and like, this is like one of those films that you're like, okay, everybody do more of this. Like, you know, if you are like, I'm beleaguered by sequels, although this is a year where I think that argument went right out the window because of uh, a film that may get talked about at some point during this podcast. But like, you know, I think this is a movie that's like, no, th like people are doing really cool, innovative stuff. Like this, there, there are ways to tell a story that like expand and like, and it's something that I think is like more accessible than probably it seems like it is. Um, but asks you to 
ab- abandon a lot of things of like what you expect from the like film form. It's really cool. So everybody go see it. What's your number two pick now that you hate me so much? I, I picked, I, no, I yeah. love you so much. That's the thing. We share a brain sometimes. <laughs> um, and I, I love your picks. Um, you know, we talk a lot about awards, obviously, here, but it's not about awards. We're doing this really. These are our I think we should just double check, you know, say it again. Like, these are our favorite yes, films. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, it happens to be, especially on your side, a lot of these are going to be up for awards um, because that's why you're the brains of the. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, these are just, these are our favorites. So, like, we will say to everybody, like, doesn't mean you have to agree. Um, it's just these are the ones that we came out of 2022. And so number two for me, though, is going to be one that probably universally seemed to be one of the most beloved films of the year. And I just couldn't. <laughs> I had to steal one from you here. I'm going Top Gun yeah! Maverick. <laughs> I mean, I, I just I'm excited that this one is still in a conversation, um, you know, for award season. But even just take that away. It's just a movie that seemed to bring people together. Yes. Like it was for everybody, old and young families and whoever. Like it's just a movie everybody could get behind. And I think it's the rare sequel that I'm going to argue is actually better than the original. Ooh. Like, I mean, I would put it right now in T2 territory of going, oh, wow. Okay. Really great first films, yeah, but sure. the sequels just add it something. Um, I remember we watched it again not too long ago for the second time, and I just went into it assuming I was not going to like it the second time. Because I was like, I thought, well, maybe it just exceeded expectations the first time. And it didn't. It's just a solid film. It's, It's not inventing the wheel by any means. Um, There's not necessarily something so original or unique, but it's just good storytelling of what film should be about. You go into the theater and you give yourself over to the characters and the story and you feel invested the whole time. Um, And everybody's likable, even the quote unquote bad guys you get you, you kind of get behind it's i i like it i really really think it's a good movie it's so much better than it should be <laughs> yeah. um so just uh, yeah it had to be my number two pick i actually and i and i i agree with you on everything except one point i would say it's actually doing something that i think is like rarefied and that it's doing something that is not so niche that you feel like You have to have seen the original to see it, which I think is really hard for a sequel to pull off in a super effective way. It's preying on nostalgia, but in a fresh way. And I think like the thing that this film is doing is there was a real, and I mean, certainly they talked about a lot in the press kits and like everything, like there was such a commitment to the style of filmmaking to make you feel like you were in it. There was such a sacrifice by the actors, I think, to put their bodies through a lot. Um, you know, not Tom Cruise, because he's, like, a, you know, immortal, obviously, Like, <laughs> but everybody else. Like, I actually think it's doing something special because it's taking someone who is, like, a towering, cocky figure and letting him still have this, but not without the burden of some years and some loss and maybe some, like different life choices than maybe you would have thought from the original. So like in that way. And I think, you know, you talk about like, it's not inventing the wheel, but it's like, it's so rare for a sequel to be in that kind of conversation of like, it might be better than the original. And I think that would be a fun, longer conversation to let it breathe out. But I like, I totally agree with you for everything you said. Like, it's like one of the few films this year that everybody just like kind of held hands around a projector and went, this is great. Like, and you don't have that. And it's surprising to me that you were worried about watching it a second time. I was. Because you yeah. were, like, giddy when we watched it the mm-hmm. second time, too. I, yeah. I, I still... I, I'm... Sh- <laughs> I am shy. If you had asked me at the beginning of 2022 if Top Gun would have made my top five, let alone my second pick, um, I, I would have been shocked. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that it was. I just really am. Yeah, I'm glad you picked it. Yeah. I'm shocked it didn't go in the first round. <laughs> really? Yeah, well, because I honestly, like, it, here's the thing. it's I knew what my number one pick was going to be, and I felt yep. pretty solid about your first pick. But even at that, I feel like if you and I combined on this, I wonder if it would have made it to the top. Just out of like, 
I don't know. Or maybe it would have still been Babylon. I will say I'm curious now where we go from here yeah. because these were the ones that I felt like we were going to be kind of, you know, yeah. battling for a little bit. So I, I'm really excited to hear your number three top film for 2022. All right. So my number three is going to be Nope. Um, if you <laughs> Fine. If you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to. <laughs> It'll never Sorry. get old. It will never. Um, uh, you know, so the like 40 people who listen to the Us episode certainly know that I <laughs> have a lot of love for Jordan Peele. Um, nope was great. Um, nope is... Uh, yeah, you know, I feel like we say this a lot, a little hard to describe because I think it definitely falls into that like realm of horror. There's no doubt, like with that, of course. Um, you know, Kiki Palmer is just it's like so, 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 so incredible in this. Um, it's really fun. It's about filmmaking. Um, you know, and but something goes wrong. <laughs> it's not like about the film industry, but something <laughs> goes very weird. Um, I just. When we watched it the first time in theater, I just couldn't stop marveling at what I was seeing and, like, what Jordan Peele was able to do. Because I think, like, the thing is, is, like, you know, if you look at the trajectory of this, like, Get Out felt like this, a a moment that really reinvented or changed the trajectory of horror. It was, like, this really, like, this cultural, like, touchstone moment. And then with us, I felt like he did something that had this, like denouement of being like wide scale but really it was about like a family home invasion story like most of the film is about that it's about like the personal the family unit this thing is massive in its scale and spectacle it has a scene in it that even as a devout fan of horror that every time I think about and we were just talking about this with someone it it makes me upset in the tum-tums like (laughs) not nausea just like yeah. Uh, like, worst <laughs> nightmares come to life. Um, yeah, so definitely. It's nope. Nope, but my number three. I... Not shocked you went with there. And it would have been, I, it was on my short list for this, so I, I'm, again, right with you. Um, just... I mean, he just keeps winning. Like, I mean, yeah. I, I I agree with you. Get Out and Us and now Nope. Um, it's just... Jordan Peele is this mind and an artist that I know that you and I have lifelong fans with us at this point. And I like that all three are their own unique, you know, type of pieces of film. Um, and it's, but still has his voice. It's, um, I think nope, maybe his best. And that's really saying something when I think, us is his best and get out is obviously his best. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I mean, this guy's just, I mean, he's just hitting home runs every time. And I just, he's the, the, you know, the artist and, and the director that we kind of need right now, because he's just bringing something so creative and unique and, and powerful with this, his storytelling. And yeah, it just, Nope is just, Phenomenal. Well, and I think like to your point of that of like this like create like this unique perspective is it's like this this person who's going towards things that feel like three different versions of horror, three different uh, like imaginings and renderings of like how a horror film can be paced and like shown, but like with this like very specific voice, but also with this like sense of like here is how I take the form and move it into this like next step. Like, but like by honoring everything before, I don't know. He's just, he's so cool. And like, and Nope is so incredible. And it's at parts like really, really desperately funny. Um, And then at other parts, just like absolute cringe. You want to crawl out of your skin from what you just saw. (laughs) Kind of feels. So with that, what's your number three pick, Ryan? My number three pick is the three hour epic the Batman. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it It quite honestly might be the best superhero film ever made, in my opinion. And I know there's a lot of screaming at the radio right now, and, and rightfully so, because there are so many great films. But, I mean, this one just speak. It's, it's up my alley. It's we, we made the joke back months ago with it, and I'll say it again. Everybody's heard Seven is my favorite film. This is the Batman in the seven universe. Like, <laughs> yes. um, it's just, I, I think we, it was fresh and, uh, a new take on the whole film Batman universe. And, uh, Paul Dano, who is just a absolute gift <laughs> to yeah. the film industry as the Riddler is just <laughs> 
amazing. You're telling me Clitz from The Girl Next Door <laughs> is one of our finest actors. You stop I just it. Love it. I mean, he's so darn good. And, you know, I, I love the character of the Riddler. Um, I was interested that they were going to take such this different take on it um but it works and it, it's you know and obviously paul dano is is so good at it but the whole cast i mean you know everybody can say what they want but robert pattison is is a really you know just terrific actor and i love his take on bruce wayne and the batman it's not perfect but it doesn't need to be yeah. um he's still really really good just yeah matt reeves with this, um, I, I can't wait. If, if this was the only film they do in this version of it, that's fine. It works on its own if they decide to keep going with it. Although I will say my only piece on it is they needed to keep that cut scene um, of, out there. And if anybody knows what I'm talking about, you will. But that that's my take on it. I just, yeah, I, I it's not a movie I'll watch all the time because it is three hours long. But it's... If you do we want to sit down and watch a good superhero movie, the Batman is it. No, I, I, I'm so glad that this came up in this conversation because I think, well, one, I just like, when we we're like researching for this, I was like, oh, that's right. The Batman came out this year. <laughs> and like, and just because it, you know, it feels like a long time since I, we had watched it for the, for the first time and I want to do a rewatch on it. I, I totally agree with you. One, I mean, like anyone who's like still just associating Robert Pattinson with Twilight is like clearly not paying attention because he's and he's so incredible in this and it's like it's such a specific vision for the Batman it's like a different you know and the thing is is we've all been waving that flag for so many years of like no it's like Christopher Nolan that's like the best one you know and and this feels like another time in which that argument can be made I mean it's Batman I'm always having a good time but like Although maybe not this movie. This movie is not necessarily a good time, but it's a really great film. <laughs> it's, it's a really dark universe to sit in, but it's incredible. And I'm glad that that's something we got to talk about today and that you remember. I had it on my like short list of things that were like films that I really admired this year. It's just it's it's incredible. It's a it's a totally new vision. And like the Riddler as an incel is like really terrifying, yeah. but it, it works. It's tapping into something. And I think that's like a cool thing that a Batman film can do when it's like, well, what would be the fears in contemporary culture? What kind of Bruce Wayne slash Batman would we need right now? Yeah. And what would those villains look like right now? And I think he did that. Yeah. What he does really nicely with it is, like you said, there's a lot of commentary um, that that's, you know, pretty. I mean, it, it, it's obvious, but at the same token, it doesn't feel misplaced in the universe that we're watching. So it's yeah. Yeah, you're not watching it going. I know what that's a reference. It's more like at ref- he does that really nice job of like hiding it so deep within the Gotham universe that it's not until like I think you reflectively later you're like, oh okay, like I see, yeah. I see you, Matt. Is this and, what you're trying to talk about? Your uh, Christmas present um, does just a phenomenal job. As well, I've used phenomenal too many times today, but I'm going to use well, it again. We're talking here. about our favorite films of the year. Phenomenal <laughs> is going to come up. Also, like my Christmas present, so you're not freaked out by what it might have been. Considering we're talking about like probably the darkest iteration of the Batman, um, uh, is my Colin Farrell, not as the Penguin, uh, cardboard cutout. Uh, I was that hoping was, you just said Colin Farrell. <laughs> I, he got me Colin Farrell. I let him go you to had the Golden Globes. One tonight. request for Christmas, I got it for you. <laughs> kind of the most perfect gift I'm like, ever. Cousin Eddie showing up with Colin Farrell in a bow. <laughs> he didn't have a bow on him, but he was perched behind our Christmas tree. Uh, but yeah, he, I mean, unrecognizable yeah. and just, yeah, great, yeah. killing it. Uh, so getting now down to the nitty gritty here, what is your number four? I don't know, man, this is like tough. Can I ask, do you go for diversity of genre or do we go favorites do we go most admired, most surprised by, freaked me out the most? <laughs> Don't worry. Still thinking about it the most? You won't get mocked or ridiculed at all if you pick the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I am, uh, uh, yep, I am going to go, yeah, I like, I think there's no way I can. Um, I'm going to go with, um, yeah, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Obviously. Nice. Yeah, obviously. Let's, um, let's pair these superhero films up. Yep. Um, I did not mean for that to happen. It's just naturally <laughs> what I think ended up happening. So here's the thing. It, when I was thinking about, like, the short list, I think I did, like, a few different versions of this, depending on which way the draft went for me, because neurotic. And 
there were times where this was on and there were times where this wasn't. And I think some of that was just like almost, well, everyone should know I love Black Panther or Wakanda forever. And I was like, so it almost doesn't need to be said, but I'm going to say it deliberately. Like, I loved it. Um, Ryan Coogler always and forever. Um, you know, we're so excited for Creed 3. I'm excited by anything he does because I think he is someone that moves the camera in a way that I find really dynamic and interesting. Um, but I think what this comes down to is like, I found the villain in this so compelling. I found how they handled what is an impossible situation, I think, for any filmmaker to find themselves in where you have to deal with death in a very real way in a film where no one is sitting there being like, oh, it's just sad because this character is dead. It's coming with this completely different way. And I'm not inventing the wheel and saying this, but I think the thing that Coogler did with this is that he found this like exact balance of like, how do I transport you and take you away and let you have the fun of a Marvel film while also rem reminding you that there's something we need to be reverent to here. Um, I will not spoil anything about this because I know it's not within everyone to get out to the movies frequently. So if you're waiting for Disney Plus, that is coming out, I think, on February 8th, somewhere in there to Disney Plus. Like, please watch it. It's incredible. Um, I'll say this. I was fine. I was doing OK for most of the movie. And then something happens in the movie. And I felt so awful for our nephew because he was like sitting near us. And I was like totally blubbering my face off. And I, I was warned like, him before we went. <laughs> I knew it would happen <laughs> at some point, And I thought I had held it together really well. And then something happens. And I just was like an absolute mess. Also, um, yeah, Angela Bassett. What what a what a treasure. Like what, what a gift to have that voice in that movie and to have that power and how she commands a scene. Oh, Oh, Namor. Namor rules. Mm. Namor's so cool. I can't, like, I will not hear criticism about this movie. I'm getting, like, pretty obstinate about it. Like, and anyone's <laughs> like, well, I kind of, and I'm like, nope, I just can't not to play up on my, my previous pick, but, like, right. I just can't hear anything negative about it. Now, I mean, guys, like, have your opinions, like, but also know that I'm, like, singing something in my head when you're saying bad things about my <laughs> <laughs> forever. Um... Yeah, I knew you would pick this. Okay, right, um, yeah. I mean, you were a champion of it and and absolutely should be. It was an impo what seemed like an impossible task yeah. in every which way um, for not. The, I mean, again, we, we are obviously Coogler fans beyond belief. Yeah. And I know you mentioned Creed 3, producer on Creed 3. Yeah, not yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. No, 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 no. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, I should not have doubted him. And not that I did. I just thought that the weight of what they had to pull off would have been too much. And, and I mean, they were able to, to somehow find a way to hit every note that they needed to in, in every emotional way while still letting the film be an MCU film, um, while still honoring Chadwick Boseman. Um, it was not an easy way to do, especially because this is was a friend, somebody that yeah. they cared about. So you also have that emotional weight on top of it. Just, But they did it. And it's a really, really terrific um, and one of the best in the MCU. And I, I yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Anybody that, that doubts it, I, <laughs> Pish posh, I say, I mean, like, and I get it. Like, you know, if you're hitting that Marvel of fatigue, like it's not that I can't understand. I mean, like I still enjoy everything, but you know, I think that's just where my fandom is. And that doesn't make me more or less of a fan than anyone. It's just like, I'm not I'm not done with it yet. And I think that's a fun space to be in. At some point, I'm going to be. At some point, I'm going to hit that fatigue. Um, but I'm glad that I didn't hit it yet. It, you know, the problem is they, I mean, they had, not problem, the joy, they had me from that first trailer. That blending of No Woman, No Cry into Kendrick Lamar's We Gonna Be All Right, like, was just blah. Like, when, as it was blending, you could start hearing the We Gonna Be. I was like, I, I <laughs> this is, this is, this is something. Yeah. Like, this is you know, shaping up to be something epic. And I thought he delivered on every yeah, note of it. I agree completely. All right. Before I start crying, what's your number four? <laughs> My number four, um, guys, check it out on Hulu. It is Dan Trachtenberg's. Ah, I'm mad. I'm <laughs> mad. Pray. Um, Except I'm not mad. <laughs> you know, this is, this is one, um, this and X I'm glad to talk about on this show one last time, although I'm sure they'll come up over, because we won't be talking about these at Oscar time, but 
damn it, we should be. And, 100%. and yep. Amber Mid Thunder, oh. absolutely. I'm not saying she should have, she should be winning Best Actress, but again, damn it, she should be in the conversation and she's not. This is one of the best performances we have seen in a long time. It is up there. It should be talked about. She is, she is, you know, um, she finds this, this way to this emotional center of, of fear and fierce of, you know, just, she holds the entire movie up. Um, and that's not to take away anything from Dakota Beavers, who plays her brother in the film, who was oh, also great. Uh, yeah. just really, but they, <laughs> to come and make a, um, a predator film, um, a predator sequel that has just been having diminishing results in the last, you know, I don't remember how many we're at at this point, but I think we're up to seven or eight and I could be a little off, but we were pretty deep in and they've just have been less and less to come back. And again, we talked about this with Todd Gunn to make something that that rivals its original. I don't even know if I want to put it in the same like, I love that they're in the same, like, they're the same universe, um, but they're such different films between Predator and Prey that um, they complement each other in their own way. So cool. Um, you know, I like that there are these these nods without going over the top. Um, I, I think the action is, you know, something that we aren't seeing enough of in, in American film. Um it's it's a movie I could get behind, and like I said, you you just sit with this character of Nauru, and I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, and again, she has to carry the whole film, and she does it. Fen- I don't almost say phenomenally, yeah, like it's just word on the podcast, yeah, yeah, just am- amazingly, and like I, I just one of the best action films I've ever seen, and I, I think this movie should be getting more conversation, and I think it's one of those ones that will stick around more and more as long ago. I think the problem, the only problem with it is what genre does it fall under? Like, is it is it an action movie? Is it a, a sci-fi movie? Is it a horror film? It kind of melds all of those, um, and it has its own dramatic aspect to it as well. If someone asked me the genre, I'd say intentionality <laughs> right that's yeah. your that's yeah. your genre and because and I, I I'm so glad you picked it although again mad um because <laughs> it makes this the next one kind of a little tough but like I will say like I think there's so much about this film in terms of wanting to honor um indigenous populations not just through story but through like labor like that that the creatives involved in this were going to be you know a move a desperate or desperately needed move towards representation um, of indigenous populations. So you have this like incredible thing that happens with that. I also think that's what makes it, you know, because it's it's weird. All right, so the the this is not much of a spoiler. Um, I had not seen Predator until this year. We will <laughs> do an episode on this at some point. Um, and I immediately loved Prey. But I think like, you know, prequels are not necessarily a thing that are going to immediately be successful just because you're telling an origin story does not mean that people are going to come out and see it. I think this is an incredibly like heroic story of like how you find one's place in your own community. And it just happens to be there's this giant, terrifying, like neon bleeding alien who's kind of messing her like hero's journey up, like in a really violent way. Um, It's Awesome. The action, I am not an action movie person. I hung on every movement in this film. I'm so glad you picked it. It's incredible. Everyone should watch it. And and honestly, even if you are not, if you're not a horror person, if you're not a sci-fi person, if you're not a person who's into like the Predator films, I think this film is just really incredibly shot. The cinematography is gorgeous. They, you know, filmed a lot of things directly on location. There were only a few things that they couldn't shoot, like, in the same area. And for that stuff, like, the digital renderings they did were amazing. Yeah. They used CGI animals to have, like, a more humane process in their filmmaking. They, the dog it was, the dog yeah. the, was a rescue. <laughs> um, and people will love... <laughs> yeah, people love rescues. Who rescued And they'll love this dog, yeah. Yeah, it's such a great story. And there is a, a way on Hulu that you can watch it in the completely Comanche language. Uh, so I really highly, you know, recommend watching it, you know, it, with that, with the way that it should be kind yeah. of seen. So, yeah. Um, and, and also, like, you know, for production, like, there's elements of 
this that can be like you know costly mm-hmm. and the fact that the production company like really committed to like the importance of that I think is like really incredible and um you know an amazing heroine in a film is always a win in Absolutely. this household um <laughs> so we're at last picks um I'm torn and and yeah I am I'm torn and I'm feeling contemplative like do you go with your weirdest experience in the film realm of the year your your, your number favorite your number five is is sitting right there i know it is it should have been talked it's about already so obvious, i know you're though. gonna get to talk about it down the line okay, more right. but there's no way you give your top five without putting it in there but we'll, i'm torn we're gonna get two. to but for the end of the episode we will get to the best of the rest so you will get to to mention a few others okay hold on can you i know we haven't been doing this what do you think my t- number five is you really want to know? Really yes, I do. I actually it? really want to know. It, I would be shocked if The Fablemans was not in your top five. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so here is what happened. And I, an audience, I'm going to be incredibly honest with you, and I need you to not judge me. <laughs> we, we do a lot of research, and we're watching films all year long. And we made a list. But here's what we did. Bef- when I demanded of Ryan, I said, I will not record this episode until I've watched The Fablemans. <laughs> and we it's got true. busy in December, and he was like, well, we got to record. Can't you just say, I'm going to see The Fablemans? And I went, absolutely not. I said, I will not let a Spielberg film pass and not be something I saw in the year that it came out. I was, like, insistent upon this. So insistent. It's still not on my list of movies I watched this year on my document. And... I'm going to be very honest. Until you said it, I had completely forgotten <laughs> that I was going to talk about the Fablemans. The Fablemans are actually my number one. It's not Babylon. Oh, God. All right. We're starting over the list. Dragon <laughs> movies. Here we go. <laughs> I, I feel I feel kind of like a proper idiot. Oh, now the buzzer's going off. Um, so here's the thing. I was, There were two films I was torn for, for my 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 five spot, which we'll talk about in the best of the rest. Um, this is the thing I'm going to say about my list. This is a very dynamic list. And I'd say if there was really like a one a and a one B or two one A's because rules don't matter. It's our podcast. Um, it'd be the Fablemans. Like it's a Spielberg film. So obviously a win. Um, it's something that I think I went into it with a particular set of notions. I was like, this is going to be about how he becomes a filmmaker. And like, it's that story. But it's about his family, and it's a story that, you know, by his own omission has talked about very openly. It's a story he waited a really long time to tell. His mom kind of demanded of him many a times, like, when are you going to tell our family's story? It's incredible. Paul Dano, um, who's coming up a lot today and is having an incredible (laughs) year. (laughs) Uh, Paul Dano plays. So, you know, so the the story is called The Fablemans. It is about, um, it is pretty much almost identical to Spielberg's upbringing and what happened in his family. Paul Dano plays his father, uh, Michelle Williams plays his mother, and Seth Rogen, in probably his best role ever, uh, plays his uncle. Um, this, the the kid who is tasked with playing young Spielberg, um, both versions of young Spielberg, um, they're both incredible actors. There is a shot in this movie that I must get a painting of, and it's where um, a young Steven Spielberg is holding up his hands in front of a projector so he can see the movie playing mm-hmm. on his hands. I just loved it so, so much. It's so beautifully composed and shot and edited, and it's everything. It, it's truly... It, look, I hope he makes a thousand and one films. And I probably said this last year with West Side Story. But if this had to be the one where he goes, you know what, guys, after this, I'm just going to like kind of chill on the universe a lot and give tours like whatever. Like, I'm just kind of ready to get into the more historical like segment of this. I'd go, OK, because this moved me in a way that I felt so grateful for having to see all the things, not all of the film influences that made him a filmmaker, but all the circumstances of life and his family and s- being supported and having to go out kind of on his own and like imagine this life for himself. And like, it's such a story about being courageous enough to like stare at the people who love you the most and say, this is the thing I need to be the most. And it's all about when you have something so deep inside you that you need and you have to do it. Cause it's like the most, oh gosh, excuse me so much. Like it's just the most important thing to do. It's uh, every, it, it's my number one. Forget it. Sorry, Babylon. Bye. Fablemans. Fablemans. <laughs> 
Fable you know, I gotta be honest ever. with you. When you took Babylon, I thought it was just to like <laughs> <laughs> to spite you, <laughs> to spite me, or <laughs> like I was like, oh, she wants to go competitive on this. Um, <laughs> I, I I wish you had given me that description of that movie before I went to see it. I know. I think I would have come out feeling differently, and I say that with following it up with this movie is. Absolutely beautiful yeah. and brilliant, and um, I, you know, if it takes home gold in in March, it deserves it. Um, it's an important film right now. On on top of everything, hundred percent. Um, and your passion for it, we talked about this. I didn't come out feeling as where you're at at the time because it wasn't what I thought I was seeing. I I got, I took a trailer and I thought I was seeing, I I thought it was a different type of film. That being said, as an audience member, you have to be willing to pivot. (laughs) And, and so it did take me a little bit to sit in it and I see it's, you're right. I think this will will look back whenever he retires and this will be his, his, this will be the film. Whether he does make a few more films after that. Well, obviously, we've got is, Indiana Jones coming. Yeah, yeah. This is, well, yeah, but that's not, I mean, he's not directing that. Yeah. Um, but this is his, like, you know, kind of movie, his movie. And I think everything that you said it is, is what is true about it. And, um, yeah, just a really beautiful piece of film work. And, and you know, to, to have a filmmaker that we all, all have grown up with um, that, you know, I would be shocked if somebody out there who doesn't love film doesn't love at least one piece of his work, you know, to see him be able to have the opportunity to make a film that gives a love letter back to his family and do it in such a relatable way for all of us is really just speaks to, you know, what makes him Spielberg, what makes him special. Well, and I think the thing is, is like, You know, I'm a Spielberg kid. Like, I think at at all stages of my life, he has made films that have spoken to what I needed to hear or what I wanted to imagine or fantasize about or be taken away by. And, like, this was just, like, at this juncture of this point in my life, like, remembering that people exist in their multitudes and that, like, we're not only solely one thing or one moment or... You know, that desire to imagine things differently does not stop at one perceived point or the importance of like, like sacrificing for your art is like not easy. We all say it is or we fantasize that it might be, but it's like also absolutely like one of the most challenging things like that you can probably do as an artist is to understand that that balance of sacrifice. Like, I don't know. It's just... Movie is everything. I will say. And I'm going to make you rewatch it. Like It does have my favorite uh, surprise actor at the near the end of the film. Holy that, shit, <laughs> yes. I wouldn't even say it's a cameo. I mean, it's an actual, like, you know, character. But, like, the actor is just, and he just nails it. And that's, you know, I just will yeah. say that. If you've seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. And when you do see it, you know. But, yeah, yeah and if my you're, favorite. And you're, if you're a film nerd, you'll be sitting there going, I think I see what they're doing. Oh, I think I see who's coming. Oh, wait. Oh, God they're playing them it's it's kind of one of those moments all right um i'm uh i'm an emotional mess yeah that's a great top five so running it back for you lauren your top five number one babylon fablements (laughs) (laughs) number two everything everywhere all at once number three what was that nope and then number four is black panther and number five which was number one in your heart the fableman so yes. that's a great top five what and is you- everyone i would recommend to all of our audience and would have been on you know my at least top list for the most part so then what is your last pick Oh gosh, I went back and forth. I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. Probably my number five. I'm not gonna say because we've already essentially talked about. <laughs> oh, okay. You're going to all right. I know. So where you're going. I want to. I want to. Yeah, I want to go a little different. I went back. I, I was between four different ones. Um, just again, it just talks about how great film is this year. Um, but I'm gonna go with the Banshees of Inner Shearing. Oh my 
goodness. Yeah. Um, if any of you thought I sounded delightfully <laughs> weird, I don't know what noise just came out of me, but I was shocked because I literally was writing what I thought your fifth pick was going to be on a sticky note to hold up in the air. Uh, sorry, I mean to surprise you so much. No, in uh, a good way. Yeah. Um, uh, anybody that saw In Bruges isn't going to be surprised that this, you know, how good yeah. this movie is. Um, and. Again, your boy Colin Farrell, just one of his best performances I've ever seen. He has to play something so needy. Yeah. And and I think um pathetic <laughs> that he doesn't normally play. <laughs> yeah, I, it's just the you know, what they're able to do, it's it's this great blend of this he, dark, dark humor. Um, and it's really funny, but at the same token, heartbreaking. And there's a lot going on. And, you know, the film is shot beautifully. And, you know, it's almost you could it's so confined um, with its actors and its its pieces. And it finds this way of being small yet um really massive at the same time um it's a really interesting blend and, and obviously the um the rapport between you know Colin Farrell and um Brendan Gleeson yeah yeah right. Yeah, Brendan Gleeson. Yes. Yeah, I was almost like, no, it's Donald, and like, no, that's the son, <laughs> Mad Eye. Yeah, um, <laughs> Mad Eye Moody. Yeah, I mean, their rapport is, is 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 you know phenomenal, but the whole cast, the main four, are just um, again top of the game. It's it's a really a testament to a director and the right cast, and just nailing it and i uh, really again it's it's both heartbreaking and hilarious um but it's not a, it's not that uh, you know please don't get me wrong this is not a straight comedy it's that darkly you know dark comedy again if you've seen in bruges you know exactly what yeah. you're getting do you think i'm dull yeah <laughs> I was a nice lad. <laughs> yeah. Kind of um, movies. Well, I, I will agree with you entirely. I think it's like, so we talked about this with um, Belfast, like the, the kind of sad Irish hug. This is kind of like the sad Irish joke where it's like, it's like really funny. It's also super dark. And, and there is, I think the Imbruge thing here is really important. If you've seen that, you can strike the tone. I also think if you've ever read Irish folk tales, yeah. um, it's Thank like a hundred like percent. Yeah. Like it, it's like a really great Irish folk tale. Now, like granted, this is obviously going to work in this house. It's Martin McDonough. It's Brendan and Gleeson. It's obviously Colin Farrell. It's a small Irish town. We love small Irish towns. Like this is all going to like super work for us in a lot of ways. But I also think, it does have like a folktale vibe to it that I think makes it really appealing that I think anyone can enjoy this movie and think it's really delightful. And and Barry Keoghan, I believe. Yeah. I, I could have that um, fastly become, and, and I was a little skeptical of him. Um, you were not a believer. I wasn't. And he is by far the best thing in the movie The Eternals. Um, yes. <laughs> and he, I mean... He doesn't steal the film, but like they said at the Golden Globes, he almost does. I yeah. mean, you could argue that he steals every moment he's on screen. And that's saying something with a cast like this. So just, yeah, just all around, just a perfectly done piece of work. All right. So, Ryan, to recap. So your top five. Yeah. Your number one film is X, which is no surprise. Um, your number two film is Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> your number three film is The Batman. Um, your number four film is Prey. Your number five film is The Banshees of Inna Sheeran. That's... All horror <laughs> movies in different ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a and again, I'd say here here is the thing that was fun about doing this draft style, and I want us to consider this in the future for other years in review, because I think we landed on something that probably would have been our collective top ten anyways, in some ways. I think there'd be maybe some small adjustments, and I think we would have maybe, like, kind of shifted maybe some things around, but I would say these are ten films, audience, that we would feel very solid about recommending to all of you so check these films out on streaming and theaters wherever you can find them but i think it would be fun and i want to do something with you i think 
we've got to talk about the things that didn't make our list, <laughs> like a best of the rest. But before we do that, because I don't, we don't want to end in a negative space. Do you have any worst films of the year? Like, can I ask you a question first? Yeah. Are there any movies that you wish you had seen this year? Yes. Okay. That we just didn't get a chance to yet. I have three films that kind of irk me that I didn't see before yeah. the close of the year, which I think we'll take care of pretty quickly. Uh, the first is The Whale. Um, you know, you don't have something that's dominating like festival circuit conversations and upcoming award seasons and the return of Brendan Fraser. Um 1999, Brendan Fraser, The Mummy is a superior film. Um, Not Blast from the Past. I Shut up, I also <laughs> got Blast from the Past. Do you ever, like, hear Bedazzled. me? Bedazzled. No, <laughs> all right, stop. But do you ever hear me, like, every once in a while, we'll talk about a movie, and I'll be like, in color. I'm referencing Blast from the Past. Because he talks <laughs> about you. his TV being in you, color in the hotel. I feel you. I do say <laughs> yes. that all the time. Um, so I would say, uh, like, without a doubt, so The Whale, um, I really want to say I want to dance with somebody. Um, you know, I they, listen. You can, I know some people get tired of, uh, like, biopics or biopics, however weird way you want to <laughs> say it. Um, but I do, I, I think there's going to be something fun to a point about that and and i'm ready to see that kind of story told in that way like in a way that maybe is more enlightening than just like kind of what i remember of whitney houston's career i don't want to have to relive the emotional moment of the super bowl between the giants and the bills how mad are you that it's in the trailer <laughs> it hurts every time <laughs> um and my last one that i kind of wish i had seen before the close of the year was bones and all um, oh, good call. I didn't expect it to be in your list, but yeah. Yeah, I, I'm kind of, I'm really intrigued by it. I, you know, I'm part of the the Chalamet Assance, um, which, you know, is just, I think really started at the beginning of his career and just keeps going. Um, so I, I, it's a movie I really want to take care of pretty soon because I thought it looked pretty fascinating. Yeah. What about you? What do you got? I mean, I'm with you. Aronofsky's The Whale. Um, Going to be, I, I'm curious. i um, not sure what to make of it. Uh, part of me, I'm hoping that we love it, but I'm also going, you know, <laughs> kind of Cautious. cautiously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think White Noise has a chance to be really good. Yeah, that and I love the... So it's based on the Don DeLillo novel, and I mm. love that novel deeply. And I don't know if White Noise is being considered 22 or 23, just to be fair. It came out right towards the end of the year, so I I'm think not it's sure. released as 22. Okay. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, Marcella the Shell, <laughs> yeah. the shoes on. Um Del Toro's Pinocchio. Yeah, that's a pretty bad one for us to miss. And I can't t- our, our niece Jenna would kill me if I didn't oh, say no. Avatar 2. I mean, she is championing that movie. And I we have to see it. Um, it's not, we've never been huge Avatar people in this household. But can household, I tell you, Jenna but, and Xander talking about it, those yeah. our niece and nephew, like, yeah. I was like, oh my God, like, I need to see Avatar. They had yeah. me so hyped up to see it and we've got to take I'll care agree. of this. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so we'll sit in that three hour epic at some point as well. So those would be my ones that I think have a chance to, that, you know, could, you know, we could really love, but we just didn't get a chance yeah. to see. What about your top three worst? Do you have a top three? <laughs> I do. Warriors. I do. Um, and some of these are disappointed more than they're yeah, the worst sure. because, like, they, them would be in there, but they, them at least was trying something um, that it just, you know, didn't pull off. Um, Firestarter, Morbius, I could throw in there, obviously. But to me, the top three worst films to me were Thor, Love and Thunder because I was really, really had high hopes for it. And just like the opposite of Black Panther, it just let me down and it was just messy and you wasted Christian Bale and it just wasn't very good. Um, And I have lots of problems with it and I really wanted to like it. I think you were probably in the same yeah. boat. I don't know if you'd put it in a top three worst, but... Uh, the next one, I shouldn't have been shocked, but I really wanted the Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, sequel to work. Oh, buddy. Come on. And there was like you a few you know. moments at the beginning and I went, this might be okay. And it wasn't. It was just yeah. got worse and worse as it went on. And I just get really angry every time I think about it. <laughs> um, and number one was the movie you made me watch. And I should have fought you on it, but... I gave in. It was Valentine's Day. Marry me. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> One of the worst rom-coms I've ever okay. seen. Okay, listen. I came of age in the 90s, the golden age of rom-coms. 
I still hold out so much hope that a rom-com is going to be good. And I am often disappointed in the modern era. <laughs> Crazy Rich Asians to me was the last great rom-com I've seen. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think, yeah, Marry Me just, I've never seen, you know, Jennifer Lopez and Owen Wilson I like on their own. And, and they've been in obviously great stuff. They're just, I've never seen two leads have so less chemistry and a romance, romantic film. It was just, it was, it was hard. It was a hard watch. Yeah. How about you? Okay. So, um, I'm going to start with Death on the Nile. Oh, yeah. It's like, I really loved Murder on the <laughs> Orient Express. Like, and I've re- I've rewatched that movie quite a few times. So I was like, ah, oh, Death on the Nile. This will be way cool. Like, Hercule Poirot, like, let's go. <laughs> um, and I so hate it. You <laughs> checked out 10 minutes into the movie. Yeah, you were like so out, and I'm like, what are you doing? And you're like, I'm on Instagram <laughs> because this movie's <laughs> terrible. It was really bad. And I just really and I listen, I know that movie ran into some issues in production and with some th- you know, unfortunately a very problematic figure within their yeah. film that led to um, editing and reshoots and I know they were beleaguered by that but they didn't cobble anything cohesive together they had a really great cast that they completely wasted. I was super super disappointed and I want there to be another one of those films. I think I'll just have to settle for whatever Ryan Johnson's doing within his, uh, <laughs> right. his It's universe. hard not to look at those films and compare them to the, you know, Knives Out two films and yeah. go, ooh, Glass Onion, far superior. Far superior <laughs> film. Um, I would say, so I'm going to be very honest, I had they, them on my list of worst. I, I don't hate, blame I, you. I really do. Sorry, didn't. I didn't mean to jump in on that. No, no, no. I thought we mo- might both have it. Um, I really didn't like that movie. Um, I would say um, they weren't They weren't trying. They went, well, mm. look what we can do. We'll be on topic. And I think what made me really mad is I'm like, I feel like there was something really interesting and terrifying you could have done about conversion camps and conversion therapy and the horrifying nature of that. The should be very illegal and immoral nature of that and just did not do anything with it. Um, A really convoluted storyline that I don't even think knew how to find its message with a flashlight and it's a camping story you should have been able to do at least that like mm-hmm. I just was really disappointed um so they them just big old thumbs yeah, down I for can't me. argue with you though. um and you know and a, and a really you know it's aggravating because there's something that you could have done that was interesting it just didn't it just really was frustrating um my other one is this weird. It's not worse. It's just the movie I'm finding myself still pretty confounded by and I think I'm um I don't know how to feel. Don't worry, darling. I look. We said don't worry. Oh wow! (laughs) Whoa! I did not see that coming. I mean, we've all talked about it for months, but yeah. And so here's the thing. I I was so obsessed with the Chris Pine disassociating (laughs) press conference and the did Harry spit and Olivia Wilde and Florence Pugh. Sorry, Miss Flo. Mm -hmm. Like. Florence Pugh just being like an absolute icon and legend at Venice. And I was so obsessed. I would like, I I remember at that particular moment, what a time to be alive. I'd just be like start of class. Who's still obsessed with this? And we'd talk about it and I made memes and I hung them on my board. Like my obsession was feverish with this, mainly because like, I feel like we haven't had a really good fun celeb gossip story in a while. Like where it's just like, this is just like, nobody's being harmed. Or maybe except Jason Sudeikis, but like for the most part, we're all just having fun here. Um, and then we watched the movie and I went, this whole movie is my aesthetic. Like mid-century modern Palm Springs, like sign me yeah. up. Like, you know, Harry Styles, like, all right, Florence Pugh, bonus fun. Like, and I thought I'd really like it. And I felt like, there was something really interesting that it was, it was like building to and like building to and then just went me <laughs> tunnel. Like, I don't know. I just I'm still kind of frustrated. It's this weird thing. I'm not saying worst, but I think a movie that did not deliver conceptually on what it was trying to discuss didn't deliver conceptually on something that could have been a really interesting conversation and left it in that space that I think oftentimes movies like this who don't know how to stick the landing do where they go, well, it's open to your interpretation. Mm. No, thank you. No, no, no. Actually, no. Open ended isn't doesn't always mean profound. Like, yeah. So I got a lot of it takes some got issues. some feelings on got this. Some huh? feelings <laughs> with Dory and we saw it later than everyone else. So I was like, and I had like a few people who were asking me, like, "Did you see it?" I'm like, "No, not yet." And then I saw it, and I'm like, "Nobody's talking about it anymore." And I was like, "This is going to come out at some point on the podcast because I'm going to get angry about it." Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I also don't know. 
know if it needs a rewatch and I need to go in with different expectations. Maybe there's some cool stuff being done. I loved her first film, Booksmart. Like, I recommend it to everyone. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I was just in a bad spot. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to lean towards this is more disappointing for you. And yeah, that's so not why worse. it lands on your list. Don't disappoint me, film. Right. <laughs> I'm so easy to please. Uh, don't worry, darling. It's <laughs> Stop okay. it. It's, uh, <laughs> you start singing the song, too. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I, I get why it's on your list. I'm a little surprised. I, I don't know what, compared to some of the things we've seen. Uh, Absolutely But not. I also get completely the, you know, this is a film film that should have landed much better and never stuck. Yeah. The Can we talk a little best of the rest? Can we get out of this negative space? I, I need I need 30 seconds to talk about something that I didn't know where to put. OK, it is the film. One of the films that was my favorite of the year. Oh, I now know where this is going. And also the film I was the most disappointed in the year. Sure, sure. Uh, May I have 30 seconds to one minute? Go ahead, audience, if you listen, because you know where this is going. I literally had no idea where to put this. Halloween ends. <laughs> <laughs> it ended. I, I want to say this. It is one of my favorite films in the Halloween franchise. Legitimately. I get very angry at some of the hate towards it. I think it's like, I don't think people are watching it on a film on its own. I think it's doing some interesting things. Is it perfect? By no means is it perfect. Um, but it's a really good, interesting horror film and there's a lot of cool stuff doing it. And it's one of the best sequels. Um, of all of the franchise. Um, I would definitely put it up there. So it really, I wanted to put it in, I, I really wanted to put it in my top favorite. But the problem is I've been also sitting in this movie now for the yeah. last bunch yeah. of months and thinking, no, I'm also completely on the other side with all those people and going, this movie was really disappointing too. Because the problem was we all got hoodwinked <laughs> like this film should have been the fourth film or you need it to end part of the story in part two uh -huh. but what happened was you i think i think studio and director kind of clashed and we got a little bit of a mess and you need it to deliver something you can't call a movie halloween ends you can't put a trailer out the way that you did you can't build up for two films mm -hmm. the way that you did and then not deliver what we all wanted and expected. I'm not always like, hey, you need to speak to the fan service. I mean, everybody knows that. And I think he put I think he put out a really good movie or a really decent horror film. Um, but it wasn't the Halloween ends we all wanted. And it wasn't the Halloween ends you built us up to have. And that left me now, two months later, really disappointed because we're going to get another Michael Myers film. We're not going to get another Jamie Lee Curtis Halloween film. Yeah. And that film should have been different. Um, or you should have changed your trilogy. Um, so I just didn't know where to put this because it could have literally landed on both sides of my list. Um, it's a movie that I will always enjoy watching, but there is always going to be that sour note of going, yeah, you, you should have given us more. Rant over. Thank you for letting me have the, the time. I yield the floor to you. Yeah, I feel like every once in a while, like every few weeks, you'll just like blurt out something else about the movie since we've seen it. <laughs> and you said you're like, look, I got a rando I got to talk about, but I don't know where it's going to fit. And I probably should have figured out that it was this, but I somehow didn't until right before you said it. But I'm not like, I don't feel dissimilar to you. Like, I think there's like aspects of this, like I wholly and completely enjoy and I don't care that it's it's maligned. And then there are other times where I'm like, everyone with their pitchforks, like, I'm with you too. Like, because um, there are things I think that it just fumbled. And I think it's not one of those, like, it's not the Halloween ends we asked for. It's the one we needed. Because I don't know that I needed that either. Like, I don't know that I did. But I also know that I enjoyed myself. And it's this weird space to be in. Like, I don't know if you're stacking it 
I, it's very complicated. We could do we could do an episode about it. We could 100% do an episode about it because I think it's I like I feel like I've talked way too much about it already, but yeah. Yeah, but I think it probably needs some more. It's like, you know, it's like the Will Smith, Chris Rock thing. Like, yeah, just talk it out every once in a while. And just check <laughs> in with yourself, see how you're feeling. Um, can we talk a little best of the rest then? Yeah, because it was a good year. In it was a really great year. Um, so, film, like, I know we both loved and we didn't get to talk about uh, without a doubt is Pearl. Um, we talked about X, but we didn't talk about Pearl. I, Pearl would have been my top in my top five, probably, and and only reason I didn't. I really thought you might pick it. Otherwise, I would have just put it right with X. Can I tell you why? I saw our list as eventually being a combined top ten, so I thought, well, yeah. X is already there, so it won't be Pearl. In some yeah. ways, I think, look, it's Pearl's aesthetic and time period that I was trying to capture speaks a little more to me. Um, it's insane and it's great and it's really cool and it's doing awesome things that's really referential to like something that would have been made in the 40s but about 1918 it's really cool yeah i mean those who don't know pearl is the prequel to x um and we will be getting a third film in this series which will be maxine that comes out in 2023 and yeah um i think i've heard people say pearl is better or a better movie and i can't really argue with that although me i will say i liked x better but again, I, I could sit down and I, I can't wait to watch both of these films they're, again. They're different. Like they are. I, ju- I don't see them as being um, in a competition with each other. To me, they are very different stories with very different sense of like politics and approaching stardom and like fame and like yeah, they complement each other. Yeah, I, I mean they, that's yeah. we we don't need to 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 compete them. We just need to to complement them. Another film that I don't think we got to talk about, but we won't talk about at all because I want anyone who hasn't seen it to go in as clear as I did not knowing anything, which is the film Barbarian, which was just such an incredible surprise. Did not make my any of my top. No, I'm surprised it didn't, actually. Mm-hmm. I thought it was, because actually, so I'm going to be honest, but when you were saying, when you started enunciating Banshees of Inishir, and I thought yeah. you were about to say Barbarian, and that's what I had written on my sticky note that I thought was going to be your fifth pick. I And I thought you were just about to say, and one that I would put on there is Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. I had that on my list as well, mm-hmm. which, which is incredibly, it's a great, like, it's not like a cutting um, look at Gen Z, but it's a really fun uh, look at Gen Z. It's like a, it's like an Agatha, it's an Agatha Christie for Gen Z. And I don't think I'm saying anything that probably hasn't already been said about it in that regards. But again, another movie, go in as fresh as you can yeah. to that one without reading a lot. I, I, I know it sounds so trite, but it's, it's a cool movie. You it's check really it cool, out. yeah. It's shot really well. There's um, one of the things that I think we both really appreciate about is they did all the lighting naturalistically and there's a blackout. So it's a lot of times they're just kind of like lit by the things that they're wearing at like a party or their phones and it makes for a really interesting atmosphere to the film. It's definitely something to check out. You you um mm. Oh, okay. Um, so this is this is the movie I had as my weirdest experience of the year, but I really recommend it. Uh, Moon Age Daydream, David oh, Bowie cool. documentary. Yeah, it's awesome. It's one of the weirdest experiences <laughs> I've ever had in a movie theater because you and I were like really tired. Yeah, and we were in an IMAX theater and we sat in the first row. So we're <laughs> that was a big just mistake. So stupid, <laughs> such a terrible idea. And I was exhausted. And I'm not even still sure what I saw, but I really enjoyed the experience. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna throw out there Elvis. I, I think yeah, we need yeah, to talk yeah. about it. You and I saw it. We went down on vacation. We were in Orlando, Florida, and we checked it out. And we both came out and were really moved and excited. And um, you know, just a, another really neat, great Baz Luhrmann film. Yeah, I would say to that, uh, it's funny because you, you're you saying it was like on our trip to Disney, so we were like, I'm going to offer a Disney flick that we haven't talked about, which is Turning Red. Oh, cool. Really yeah. really enjoy Turning Turning Red, if you grew up in the uh, golden age of boy bands and TRL, there's an aspect of that that I think can really speak to one's soul, but it's really fun and it, it deals with the you know metaphor of puberty, I think, in a really fun way, um, in a way that apparently made people piss, but that's their own hangups. <laughs> yeah, but, that's like, right. but I thought it was really entertaining and fun. Um, I'm always going to go with an Eggers film, The yeah. Northmen. Um, you know, I will be honest. Northmen is not, does not live up to The Witch or The Lighthouse to me, but it's still a, a really great Eggers film. And um, yeah, check it out. Not an easy watch, but a really good watch. Can I tell you something? Yeah. I think it's my favorite Eggers it's, film. It doesn't shock me. Um, well, it's like, yeah. the, it's like the basis for Hamlet. So this is like the story that Shakespeare based Hamlet off of. 
It's really incredible. Incredible Anya Taylor-Joy performance. I mean, all of, but you say that about all of her performances, but yeah, mm-hmm. I think, honestly, The Northman is probably my favorite Eggers film. Um, I'm gonna go Adam Sandler, always good in a dramatic role, Hustle. Yeah, that was a fun movie, and Philly Love, of course. Oh, yeah, a lot of Philly Love. We talked about this earlier, but Glass Onion was, like, yeah. an incredible delight. Um, I actually think, in some ways, I, I think I may even prefer it a little bit to Knives Out. I'm with you. Yeah, there's something Uh, about this one that really, like, charmed me. Yeah, I didn't think Daniel, I didn't love Daniel Craig's performance as much. I thought he got a little more, too more cartoony. Um, But but, don't you, wait, no, that'll spoil something, never mind. But I will say, I think, I I thought the movie overall was even better than Knives Out, yeah. You talked about this uh, earlier, like, about this being such an incredible year in horror and probably one of the best. I think a movie that should really be in that conversation with that is the film Black Phone. Yeah, I definitely. loved that movie. I, I was like, that's a really effective horror movie. Um, you know, it's got that thing that will, like, that we love about, like, Stephen King stories and Stranger Things stories based on a, um, you know, a short story by Stephen King's son. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, like, really awesome. Um, I, I agree, and it's got one of the best uses of a Pink Floyd song. Yes, it <laughs> does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of Anya Taylor-Joy, uh, I thought The Menu was a really great film. I know there, you and I both had a little bit some issues down the back stretch of the film. Yeah. Um, but overall, just I thought it was a really interesting movie that I, I think deserves to be checked out. Any others for you? Uh, the last one would be one of the first films we saw of the year, and I and, and I'm glad to finish it out with that because I I didn't think I'd be sitting here talking about it as one of my favorite films. I was a little worried about it, but Scream. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah or yeah. Scream Five. <laughs> Please just call it Scream Five for the love of God. Also, uh, Jenna Ortega having an incredible year, of course. But this has been really fun. I like doing this as a draft. Please let us know, audience, if you like this in draft format. Um, I feel like it took some of the pressure off because I was like, oh, I only have to pick five films. And I got to go first. So I got to or I got to have a lot of dibs. So maybe this year it felt easier because I got the number one pick. You know somebody's listening to the show going, you, yeah, you did a top five, but then you guys gave about ten other films that people should check out. It is our podcast. We make the rules. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for listening. We are very excited for the things um, upcoming this season, uh, which we'll be teasing out on our Instagram. Um, we have our someone's birthday episode. is yeah. coming up. <laughs> I'm not going to give any hints, but... It's a... By the power oh. of Grayskull! <laughs> you can't help yourself. Um, so um, our, our next episode, now that Ryan has said this, our next episode is going to be Masters of the I Universe. I have the power! He's just going to yell quotes. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm just gonna post, um, you know, Skeletor daily affirmations on our Instagram page. It's going to be such a weird conversation. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for listening to our 2022 year in review. Hopefully there are some films on here that you also loved. Um, you know, disagree with us if you like to. Um, or maybe discover something that we talked about that maybe you hadn't thought about checking out. That's always like a fun consequence of making these kind of lists that maybe you find something for yourself. Um, if you're not currently following us on social media follow us at how could you podcast on instagram at how could you pod on twitter on facebook we are at facebook.com backslash how could you podcast you can also listen to all of our episodes on youtube um, at youtube.com backslash how could you podcast we'll be posting information about our upcoming episodes anything we'll be doing with local cinemas so check out our social media pages to stay on top of all fun things coming uh with the podcast in the new year and to all of you you know thank you for all of your listens throughout 2022 it means the world to us uh so that's why we love doing this and we love the fact and we appreciate so much each and every one of you taking the time to listen to us so have a happy new year and until next time enjoy the odyssey